This is a case presentation of an endovascular management of a basilar artery occlusion secondary to a fusiform aneurysm with an intraluminal thrombus. This is a 51-year-old man who presented with a past medical history only for hypertension and developed acute onset of dysarthria and left-sided hemiparesis. On arrival at the outside hospital, the left hemiparesis resolved. On source image CT angiography uh, was remarkable for mid-basilar fusiform dilatation, which demonstrated some mass effect, as well as evidence of a mid-intraluminal uh, thrombus. Uh, the remainder of the intracranial circulation uh, was intact without evidence for large vessel occlusion. CT angiography of the neck on sagittal and coronal views demonstrated a dominant right vertebral artery and also demonstrated the extent of the fusiform dilatation and more clarity of the basilar artery aneurysm. Upon arrival at our institution, the patient's exam was only significant for dysarthria. However, 48 hours after he presented, the patient acutely became comatose and was emergently brought to angiography for uh, possible thrombectomy, particularly knowing what we knew from his prior CTA. Um, AP and lateral right vertebral artery injections demonstrated a mid-basilar occlusion. We could visualize the proximal fusiform segment of the aneurysm. We then proceeded to place a solitaire 6x40 stent retriever device into the left P1 segment, into the mid basilar segment, and upon withdrawal of the device noted rapid expansion of the radiopaque markers. Upon removal of the device and control angiographic runs demonstrated improved anterograde filling of the distal posterior circulation. However, there was a very large flow defect in the mid basilar segment, um, which presented a very significant management uh, dilemma. At this point, it became clear that additional attempts at thrombectomy, either using a stent treve or aspiration, would not be as effective given the large diameter of the fusiform segment. We also considered administering intraarterial alteplase, which did not yield much benefit. There were also considerations of placing a stent acutely to jail that thrombus and to prevent it from potentially migrating more distally. In the end, we opted for observation and over the course of about 30 minutes with control angiographic runs demonstrating that the clot had not demonstrated any movement and it was stable and anterograde filling was uh, had persisted. At that point we decided that we would perhaps consider jailing it at a later delayed stage. MRI of the brain demonstrated surprisingly small areas of restricted diffusion in the pons as well as the cerebellum. We then, because of the intraluminal thrombus, started the patient on an intravenous heparin drip and repeat angiography was then planned for about five to six days later after starting the patient on dual antiplatelets. On the second angiogram, we could see that the intraluminal thrombus had diminished in size. We then proceeded to place a series of three overlapping pipeline embolization devices from the normal segment of the distal basilar into the more normal diameter of the proximal basilar it did take the outer contour of the basilar artery. Unfortunately, the procedure went without complications um, and surveillance CT angiography just before discharge demonstrated adequate flow within the posterior circulation and good wall apposition without any unexpected uh, flow diversion migration. The patient was discharged to acute rehab 12 days after admission and started on dual antiplatelets. Fortunately, at one year, the patient's Clinical exam remains relatively favorable. He's alert and oriented with normal mental status. He does have some persisting dysarthria. He does have increased reflexes and increased tone, but he's able to ambulate, and he has a modified ranking of two. One year control angiographic runs demonstrated a dramatic improvement in the in, in reduction in the fusiform dilatation of the mid basilar artery.